Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. We are continuing our MMT conversation. Uh, thank you to Jeff at Citizens Media TV. He has opened me up uh, to many people in this world, and we're going to talk to even more experts, and today we are doing that. Uh, Fadel Kaboob is the associate professor, is an associate professor at economics at Denison University and the president of the Global Institute of Sustainable Prosperity. Uh, Fadel, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Um, so first of all, let's talk about um, the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity because I interviewed another MMT person, Stephen Hale from Australia, who's also a part of it. Tell us a little bit about what this is. And to everybody watching, I will put a link to this website in the show notes so you can, everyone can kind of under, get a better understanding of it. So the, the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity is now uh, about four years old. Um, we, when we had the opportunity to start this institute, we, we didn't want it to be exclusively an economic policy institute or, and exclusively focused on the U.S. We want it to be a, a global institute dealing with, with global issues, so international issues, um, but also <clears throat> because the issues that we deal with are so um, multifaceted. So take climate change, for example, there's an economic dimension to it, there's political dimension, there's ethical, scientific, there's so many different dimensions to it. So if you approach it, for example, purely from an economic standpoint, you'll be, you'll be missing the point. Right. So every global issue that has multifaceted dimensions to it and multiple root causes requires an interdisciplinary perspective. And that's really the effort that we wanted to build with this institute. So yes, there's a core group of economists involved in the institute, but we have legal scholars and environmental scientists and engineers and, and people from the humanities and political science who are interested in some of the core issues that, that we address. So it's not purely an MMT uh, institute, although we have you know a critical mass of MMT economists and MMT legal scholars involved with us, um, but we have progressives from all kinds of disciplines who were sort of um, warming up to the ideas of MMT, but I wouldn't say, you know, endorsing MMT 100% or kind of work on MMT issues 100%. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a coalition, it's a network of um, uh, scholars from all over the world who are interested in addressing some of the major challenges that we face. Right. And some of those major challenges include unemployment. Um, some of those challenges in include climate change. Uh, inequality, global inequality, inequality within regions. And these are issues that, you know, you hear about a lot in the media, you hear a lot about in, in, in public policy discussions, but it's, it's more of the same. It's, you know, who are we going to tax in order to fix climate change? And if we can't tax the rich, then we're going to just lose this, this battle. Right. Um, so, so what we provide as a, as a network of, of scholars is a different lens that allows us to tackle some of those major issues without sort of shooting ourselves in the foot constantly and saying, well, we can't do anything. We're going to just sit on our hands and, and do nothing. Uh, let me, well, let me ask you this. How do you see, and, and it sounds like you're, you're kind of attacking this or, or through this global institute. Um, how do you view all of the aspects of, well, I'll give you this example of, of climate change. So I did a video several weeks ago about the rising sea levels just in North America are going to make people on the East and West Coast have to move. And the East Coast of the United States has about a third of the country's population. So there's going to be upwards of 100 million climate refugees that are gonna have to potentially move inland by the year 2040. So one of the things we were having in the discussion, what are we going to do? Where are all those people going to go? Where are they going to live? Where are they going to work? Where are they going to all that stuff? So how right. does MMT factor into that issue and the discussion of that right. issue? Well, the, the issue of uh, climate change, creating climate refugees, is already, it's already happening. I mean, not yet in the U.S. and in, in the significant uh, kind of dimension that you're describing here, but it's already happening all over Africa, all over the Middle East. I mean, a lot of people forget that the Syrian crisis, the refugee crisis that most people discuss in the media, people think of it as post-Arab Spring, after the civil war, the conflict started, 
thousands of people started moving, millions of people started moving. As a matter of fact, 1.5 million climate refugees moved internally within Syria three years before the conflict. And this was never reported because Syria experienced the most severe drought in its history. Syria used to be self-sufficient in food production. And with this drought, it completely destroyed lively, people's livelihoods in rural areas. 1.5 million people moved internally. And of course, when they moved, they moved to the big cities where they think there's food, there's jobs, there's schools, there's housing. But of course, there wasn't. And that added to the political tension, social and economic tension within the major cities. You know, and of course, the rest of the conflict happened. I'm not saying it was all because of climate change, but it's just one of those things that exacerbates existing tensions and, mm. and inequalities and things of that nature. It's already happening in so many other countries all over Africa and in terms of, of drought, pushing people from rural areas into uh, major cities and, of course, putting so much pressure on government resources and schools and food and all kinds of things. So it's, it's already happening. It's just not reported and not analyzed in a way that highlights the importance of climate change. We highlight the political and democratic and human rights, which are important. But we can't forget the role of climate change and exacerbating all of these problems all over the world. So what, what you think is, is going to happen in the U.S., it's already happening in other parts of the world. Um, so the question is, what is the lens that MMT brings that allows us to address this? Um, so the... In, in, a, in a couple of bullet points, just to remind some of viewers what, what MMT principles are so, we, that, so that we're on the same page. And it's one of the frustrating thing about people trying to you know, comment on MMT without really understanding some of the key features is they immediately conflate uh, the situation of the U.S., for example, with Zimbabwe or Argentina and say, well, if we do this, we'll become like Zimbabwe. Oh, wait a minute, you know, the U.S. is the U.S. and it has a whole set of institutions, a whole set of financial um, privileges that Zimbabwe doesn't have. So I can talk about developing countries. I can talk about, you know, countries like the U.S. and Japan, and the issues are separate. But the basic definition that allows us to understand the power of this MMT lens is what, what we call financial sovereignty or monetary sovereignty. So how do we define it? To start with the basic definition. It's a country that issues its own currency. That's easy. Most countries do that. It's a country that taxes its people in that same currency. So the U.S. will not accept taxes, you know, denominated in Canadian dollars. It has to be U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Number three, it's a country that never borrows in a foreign currency. In other words, when the U.S. issues bonds, issues U.S. treasuries, it's always promising to pay you back principal and interest in U.S. dollars and only in U.S. dollars. Now, this is where developing countries start losing financial uh, sovereignty because they frequently issue debt denominated in dollars and euros and Japanese yen and British pounds. And that's, that's money that they can't issue. That's a currency that they can't control. They have to earn through exports or, or other means. And that's where they get into a debt trap. So the entire U.S. debt stock is denominated in U.S. dollars. That's full financial sovereignty. And number four, which is related to three, it's trying not to peg your currency to gold or silver or a foreign nation's currency. Mm -hmm. So in other words, allowing your exchange rate to fluctuate based on economic conditions and not setting it and locking your interest rate at a particular price. Because if you do that, then you're going to have to, you may get into a situation where you have to borrow in a foreign currency to stabilize your exchange rate. And this is, again, where developing countries get stuck into that situation. And I'll, I'll be happy to explain with a very simple example what sets the U.S. apart from a country like Argentina or Syria or Egypt or any developing country that's stuck in a, in a debt trap. So when we talk about government debt in the U.S., it's all in U.S. dollars. But when we talk about developing countries, we have to distinguish between government debt denominated in their national currency, which is sovereign and they can control it, versus what we call the external debt. That's money they borrowed from foreign countries with the promise to pay back in a foreign currency that they don't have, that they can't print, right? And that external debt creates a huge burden on those developing countries. So you would ask the question, why would any country give up its financial sovereignty and start borrowing in a foreign currency. It sounds, you know, silly. Why would you do that if you have the full authority of a sovereign independent government? Well, it turns out it has to do with economic deficiencies 
that developing countries typically suffer from. And when you zoom in, you find three basic deficiencies that they struggle with. Number one is that they're not self-sufficient in food production. Mm -hmm. So they end up importing a lot of food just to you know, keep their society going. Number two, they have an energy deficiency. They have to import a lot of fossil fuels typically to keep their economy running. And now you, you hear you know, some of the, the economists saying, well, they need to produce faster and export more. Well, that means that you have to import more fossil fuels to fuel their economy. Unless, of course, I'm hinting to the solutions here, you invest in renewable energy where you can fuel your economy without having to import. And part of the solution in terms of food is you know, shifting your food production system to more sustainable local agriculture as opposed to you know, this export-oriented food uh, growth that many developing countries have pursued for many years. And then the third deficiency, which is a, a more you know, uh, structural deficiency, is the fact that these countries that have industrialized over the last few decades, they didn't really industrialize in the same way that Japan industrializes or the US or the UK, because they've been sort of pushed into a situation where they can only specialize in producing low value added content. Mm -hmm. So for example, if and you um, grab a cell phone or any kind of piece of uh, electronics that's you know, made in um, you know, Malaysia or made in, in any developing country, it's, it's tricky because all the components in there are not made in that country. You know, the high value added content is probably made in you know, the, the, the copyright and the intellectual property stuff is, you know, uh, you know, in the U.S. or in Japan or in, you know, high, you know, um, highly industrialized countries. But what you end up doing is buying all the inputs, all the components, sh shipping them to a developing country and hiring cheap labor to assemble it. So the contribution of that country is low value added content. And that's what they export. They import all the high value added content and they export the low value added content. And in the long run, you're always digging yourself in a bigger hole because you're, you're never catching up. You're always just contributing with the cheap labor, you know, under miserable conditions and no environmental regulations, all that stuff that we talk about. But it's a structural issue. But then they say, well, in order to move up the, the ladder, you just have to work your way out of it. There's, there's no working your way out of it unless you invest in education, research and development, mm -hmm. uh, vocational training to move up the skill set so that you're producing the higher value added content. And that's what the neoliberals typically don't advise you to do because they tell you also cut spending on education and infrastructure and all the things that will actually solve the problem right. that tell you not to do it. Right. And this is, this is really the, the, the trap that, that developing countries are into. And this is sort of not just an intellectual kind of business uh, uh, discussion here. We're having a discussion about something that touches people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis and it's so dangerous politically and socially and so destabilizing because of the following scenario so if you have a, a typical developing country that depends on food imports depends on energy imports and doesn't have the most sophisticated industries then at the end of the month or at the end of the year what they have is they have a trade deficit which means they import more than what they export and that means the, their exchange rate, the value of their currency relative to the dollar starts to fall, which means the next morning when they're about to go out and buy wheat or rice or medicine or anything for their population, right? Because they depend on food imports. Those things are going to become more expensive in real terms because their currency is cheaper. And now you have food riots on the streets and now you have energy riots because people can't afford the bus ride unless the government steps in and borrows in foreign currencies to stabilize the exchange rate and kind of subsidize the existing system and never really fix it because you're always putting a band-aid on this thing oh, right. and that's, that's really the trap that developing countries suffer from the us is not in that situation right the japan is not in, in that situation the uk is not in that situation so it's frustrating when we're talking specifically about the us somebody throws in argentina or or Japan, or Syria, or Zimbabwe, or whatever, and I say, well, wait a minute, we can have a discussion about that, and I can, I can provide you an MMT-informed solution to those scenarios, but don't tell me that the U.S. is going to go into a hyperinflation cycle like Zimbabwe, right. because we're not in the same situation. 
Okay. Well, that's, that, again, very informative as I uh, slowly um, unpack and learn more about MMT and, and now we're talking about it on uh, uh, globally. But I want, I want to focus on this with the U.S. because I just watched um, some videos that several countries, all of them who, who we put sanctions on, are stopping, they're, they're, they're ending the use of the U.S. dollar and they're buying more gold. So I heard about um, China doing this, Russia doing this, Venezuela doing this, and uh, I believe Iran. Um, and then I hear talk of, you know, I'm sure that's connected to the fact that every, I hear so many people say that we are, uh, we're, we're on the brink of another financial meltdown because we have all of these bubbles. We have another housing bubble, we have a student loan bubble, we have a car loan bubble. So how do you see those things that I've, I'm talking about um, and MMT? Like, I guess my question is, how, what, when, is, what, is, what is the, when is this financial, not when, it's hard to predict that, but what is this financial crisis or meltdown that America looks like it's, in, it's in, inevitable for it to have? Um, because we also are, I, I'm, you know, I'm reading we've created all of this currency and we, we have all the, this debt. How does this, how does MMT fit into this in, in terms of solutions um, right. and understanding and, and, and all of that? I know I'm not giving you like a very concise uh, <laughs> question here because it's sort of a lot I got to, it. to digest. Yeah. So um, I want to go back to the climate change question later because we didn't finish it, but this is this is very important. Okay. So on the on the gold, you know, Russia and Iran and other countries, it's it's really not a solution for those countries because you're 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 moving away from the U.S. dollar to another you know form of a commodity in this case, gold that you don't control and you can't issue into existence. You still have to earn it, right? Uh, it's it's more of a political strategy. It's not really an economic solution. It's not gonna not going to save their their economies. It's, they're they're on the wrong track uh, to begin with. But on the, on the U.S. situation, and this is another piece of the puzzle that allows us using an MMT lens to really sort out what causes financial crisis and what's going to push us into the next recession. And it's the distinction between um, personal finance and federal government finances. So the, you know, and you hear this a lot during the, the political campaign, you know, sitting down at family, sitting down at the kitchen table and trying to balance the books and, you know, vote for me and I'll make sure that, you know, the government is responsible, just like you hardworking Americans are responsible of balancing their books. This is, this is a huge myth and confuses a lot of people and, and confuses public policy tremendously. So let's, let's sort it out in a very simple way. You have the federal government as the only issuer of the US dollar. There's no debate about it. The US dollar legally comes from the US. If anybody tries to issue US dollars, they go to prison for a long time. It's counterfeit, right? So that's, that's clear, there's no debate about it. So in order for us to have US dollars in existence to buy and sell and lend to each other, it has to come from somewhere. And the only source is the US federal government, not states, not municipalities, the federal government. So the federal government is the issuer of the currency. The rest of us are users of that currency. And as a result, we, we operate under a completely different set of financial rules, meaning that for me to be able to buy a car or you know afford whatever I want, I need to work hard, earn that money, and then spend it. I can also borrow from a bank if a bank wants to lend me money or borrow from a friend. But then again, now I have a debt. I have to work hard to pay it off. Same thing for um, businesses, you have to earn it and then spend it, or you borrow from a bank and then you have to work even harder to pay it off, right? So earn it first or borrow it first, then spend it. That's the logic. Same thing for states and municipalities and for uh, uh, any kind of local government agency, you have to tax the local population first in order to build the schools or you know fix the roads or, pay for firefighters or whatever it is, or states have to borrow by issuing debt and then promising to pay back in the future by raising more tax revenues. That's absolutely true. It's true for states, municipalities, individuals, and, and companies, but it's not true for the federal government. 
because the federal government is on the other side of the fence. It's the issue of the currency that the rest of us use and leverage and, and borrow and lend to each other. So it must spend money into existence first, then tax some of it back. Okay. That's, that's a very important piece of logic that a lot of people confuse. Um, public policy leaders, economists, and, 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 and progressive activists even say, well, we have to tax the rich in order to spend on fighting climate change and, and fixing infrastructure. These are two separate issues. Yes, tax the rich because they're too rich or because there's, you know, we want to deal with issues related to inflation or we want to discourage certain kinds of behavior, certain kind of consumption. You can tax gambling, you can tax pollution, you can tax all of those things because we want less of those things as a society. But don't tie this piece of legislation to funding the fight against climate change or funding schools or funding public health mm -hmm. because the federal government can do both. Right. And they're separate issues. And, and that's where a lot of progressive activists and, and, um, and, and climate change activists really end up kind of hurting their cause by tying it to a particular tax. So what if we, we tax pollution out of existence, right? If we discourage all of the pollution, then what do we do? How do we fight the, how do we fund the rest of, you know, the fight against climate change? Because, you know, we we're, we're way, you know, uh, over our heads when it comes to, to running this battle. And I'll give you a very simple example that most Americans will understand because it's pretty straightforward and it's well taught in history. It's just a little bit of twist that confuses people typically. World War II came right after the Great Depression, the most miserable economic time in U.S. history. No question about it. There's books and movies and stories about it. Everybody knows the Great Depression. But then everybody knows also the history of World War II and the massive amount of production mm -hmm. and military might that was put into place in a matter of months, right? right after the Great Depression. So during the Great Depression, we were told that everybody was broke. There was no money. There was no money to be taxed to fund anything, right? It was miserable. And then all of a sudden, all of this massive military might was built. We moved from 25% unemployment to zero unemployment. We had to go beyond zero unemployment. We had to bring women into the labor force, retire people into the labor force just to keep up with the production for the war effort. And that's a massive boom in economic activity. How did we pay for it? Was there ever a debate in U.S. Congress about who are we going to tax in order to fund the war? Or where is the money going to come from? Money was created into existence because there is a consensus. This is something that has to be done. We have the technology. We have the manpower. We have the resources. And we need to do it because it's the right thing to do. There was no question about money. People worked, were paid on time. So there was money created by the federal government. Things got done, right? We marshaled all the resources to get the public purpose that we wanted to achieve. Nobody was taxed to fund the war. But then people say, oh, the government borrowed money. Well, it's, again, there was no money to be borrowed, right? We were in the midst of the Great Depression. The borrowing that most people talk about, the freedom bonds that the Treasury sold, they call them freedom bonds because they wanted to capitalize on the patriotic mood of, of the nation. Freedom bonds were not sold before the war. They were sold during the war. So money was already spent into existence. People had a lot of cash in their pockets. And like any normal person during that time, what would you do with your money? You want to buy a new car. You want to buy a new house. You want to spend it. But the entire city of Detroit, industrial system in Detroit, was shifted away from producing cars to producing military equipment. There were no new car models during the first three years of, of the war because everything was dedicated to, to the war. So even if you wanted to buy a new house or a new car, you wouldn't find it because right. everybody was working mostly for it. So this would have caused inflation. If everybody wanted, went out and started bidding up house prices and car prices, we, we would have a serious issue of inflation. So freedom bonds were sold at the time to convince the population that had a lot of cash to spend to postpone their consumption until after the war. And that's exactly what happened after the war. So the bonds that were sold was not to fund the war. The war was already in, in place. The funding was already there. So selling government bonds is not the same, federal government bonds, is not the same thing as the state of Ohio or the state of California selling bonds. Because why would the federal government need to borrow its own money? That's kind of a silly thing. 
It doesn't. But the federal government needed people to postpone their spending for a while until after the war to prevent inflation and to stabilize interest rates and to stabilize financial markets. There's a whole set of reasons why gov federal governments sell bonds. And it's definitely not to fund anything. Well, this, this is the best example I can think of. And this is really when, when people tell me you can't fight this climate change on a massive scale, we have to do it kind of bit by bit. And maybe by 2050, if we're not dead, we'll put a dent in this thing. That's why I go back to this example. We can, you know, marshal the resources at a scale that the U.S. did during World War II, but dedicate this not to invading countries or destroying things, but to fixing the climate. Well, this is we financially we can do it. I mean that that is a that is a crystal clear laser of an example that really I mean my, my I mean all of the MMT videos that I've done and the the research I've done on it and I'm I'm definitely my eyes have been open to it that is the most that is the clearest most concise example to just walk Americans through that history that right. the United States the federal government decided to spend all of this money or create it without to they decided we're going to we're going to spend this money on the war machine and put everybody to work and yeah. the bonds that, that I mean that the bonds were used to stave off here, inflation here is the thing it's not the only example this is the 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 largest scale intervention but every piece of government spending is also in the same way and and you know all the way up to just a few months ago when the when the military budget uh, bill came through there was no discussion in congress the democrats or republicans of how are we going to pay for this who are we going to tax to do this well there there was no discussion this is the military budget we're we're all going to do it you know regardless of who you are i mean we quibble a little bit about this and that but at the end there was no question how are we going to pay for it what are we going to have to cut in order to do this? But then once it's passed, everybody turns around to all the social issues and says, well, we can't afford that. We can't afford this. How are we going to pay for it? What else are you going to cut in order to pay for social security or pay for education or health care? And that's that's really the the frustrating issue that, that never, never gets discussed enough. And, and I think this is the major MMT contribution is to open up this new set of um, lenses for us to look at how federal governments spend and clarify to us what states and municipalities do and they're limited in terms of what they can do because they're limited by their tax base versus what the federal government does well this is fantastic and now in that in the world war ii example is is the answer to how mmt can fix the um you know, fix climate change. I've talked about this a lot on my show of a, of a Green New Deal, and that's exactly what the federal government could do is just say, we are putting all these people to work, building wind turbines and solar panels and high-speed rail and whatever that is, we're spending all this money on, on research and development. No right. one's unemployed anymore. Everyone has a job here in America figuring out how we're going to reverse climate change so we don't so the human race doesn't die out and right. um we should cut the military budget just because it's not ethical but that's not, a separate issue yeah that's a separate issue but not cut the military because we need the money to fund this right those are two this is issue number one you know go for it issue number two go for it but you don't have to cut money from here to add there this this is this is the this is where we start going back into the trap and we end up pegging people against each other right. for right. no this is my budget this is your budget and cut yours so that I have more or cut mine so that you have more and and it's it's just a, a, a waste of uh, time and energy and resources while the whole you know planet is is burning I mean this is this is the thing we have millions of people unemployed in this country around the world we have you know the planet is on fire as we speak, and we have technologies that's available to us to, to reverse this, to fight climate change, and the technology is getting cheaper by the day. So we have all the pieces of the puzzle, millions of people who want to work, the planet needs to heal, and we have the technology and, and the know-how and the brain power to do it, and then we sit on our hands and say we can't afford it. We don't have the money to do it. And this is where you know MMT gives us this lens that says, 
we can do it. If you have the physical resources, the know-how, the technology, anything that's physically producible, or we have the physical material resources and brain power is also financially affordable for the federal government in the United States. And this is true for Japan, this is true for the UK, it's true for Australia, for Canada, all of these countries that fit that basic definition that I started with of full financial sovereignty. The countries that have lost their financial sovereignty, the developing countries, we can talk about that if you're interested, but it, it has to do with addressing the root causes of why they lost their financial sovereignty, which is energy imports. Well, guess what? You can shift to renewable energy. You don't have to import fossil fuels because it's local domestic, right? The wind blows everywhere. The sun shines everywhere. You know, the waves, you know, the tide works everywhere. Geothermal, you know, volcanoes and even geothermal ventilation. We just need to rethink the way we build things, we design things in a more sustainable way. And it's really not inventing a lot of things because a lot of these uh, kind of more um, self-sustaining, ecologically self-sustaining technologies are not new. They were not invented at MIT. They were not invented you know, by hippies in the 70s. They date back to thousands of years. Native people knew how to use the rivers. They knew how to use, you know, build houses that are warm in the winter and, and cool in, in the summer without using just basic geothermal adobe houses and things like that. Mm -hmm. We need to go back to those basic principles of uh, natural survival yeah. and upgrade them to the 21st century way of life. Mm -hmm. And it's not we're going back to live in the desert and, 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 and struggle and, and die. I mean, if we, if we stay on this path, this is probably what will happen yeah. to humanity. But if we take the technologies that actually work in a sustainable way and do research and development and innovation in terms of material science and, and all kinds of engineering and design that get us to higher quality of life and comfort without destroying the planet, that's where we need to be going. And that's where universities need to de dedicate resources, federal government grants need to be dedicated to creating a way that allows us a high quality of life and employment for everyone and research and development that feeds into this new way of running an economy. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, really that, that uh, <laughs> everything you just said really goes into all that. I mean, it, it shows how um, it, it gives great, just basic understanding of MMT. It shows uh, the solution to climate change and also the answer that plagues as we were talking about before before we recorded that plagues many progressives this is the thing that made jeff epstein reach out to me at citizens media tv because he's like graham you have a great message it's just you're missing this one piece right. and it's good to see like jimmy door just had stephanie kelton on his show um so we're all we're all thanks to folks like you and jeff and everybody else we're all starting to wake up to this fact and that's the thing that World War II example, dude. That is yeah. that is your that's your bumper sticker. That's your <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's hard to fit all of the MMT ideas in a bumper sticker. And that's why sometimes it's it's really hard pill to swallow. Because if with everything we discussed right now in the last twenty or thirty minutes, we haven't covered everything, but this is kind of the beginning of kind of opening somebody's eyes to a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And once you start, you know, absorbing these principles, you, you realize that the sky is the limit. As long as we have the willpower, the know-how, the, the material resources, we can do it. But if we're like a developing country where we don't have the technology, we don't have the know-how, we don't have the skilled labor, then it doesn't matter how much money you print, you're not going to get there. You're going to cause hyperinflation. And this is exactly how hyperinflation develops in, in, in developing countries where you know, people are hungry because there's no food. So food prices go up. So then the government starts paying the military officers and the police officers higher salaries so that they can afford the food. But there's no food. So they're just bidding up the price even more. And it spirals out of control. And it's not going to end no matter how much money you print. You're just feeding the inflation beast until you actually produce more food. Or another country donates more food and floods your, you know, your economy with plenty of affordable food. To, to stave off that hyperinflation. And, and this is really where developing countries, in order to reclaim their monetary sovereignty, 
and, and because they have this huge external debt that's denominated in dollars and euros and yens that forces their economy constantly to be you know kind of running uh in these infinite cycles of trying to export their way out of poverty. Right. And guess what? Right. The more you try to export, the more you end up importing because your economy is weak. You have to import all the components. Right. And if you're specializing in exporting uh, bananas, let's say, well, guess what? Most of your neighbors are specializing in exporting bananas anyway, lots of developing countries. So you end up driving you know, those prices down. Even developing countries that export a lot of oil, like Venezuela, for example, um, most developing countries that have massive amounts of oil, they actually import energy. Most people don't realize this because they're exporting crude oil. And then because crude oil, you can't really do anything with it. You can just burn it, right? But what we do consume is gasoline, which is refined petroleum, uh, petrochemicals that go into paint and all kinds of industrial products. Those are high value added derivatives from crude oil. So developing countries export the low value added crude oil and end up importing all the high value added derivatives. So as an oil exporter, you're still losing in that game because you don't have the technology to refine the petrochemicals or you know, the petrochemical industry is dominated by big oil companies that will not let you compete and that kind of stuff. They'll be happy to buy your crude oil for cheap, but then sell you the refined product at double the price. And so even oil exporters are losing in this game, right? So what is the solution? Renewable energy domestically, sustainable agriculture domestically, even in countries that don't have a lot of water resources and suffer from uh, droughts and things like that. There is sustainable agriculture techniques that save um, 90 to 95 percent of water use. I'm, I'm thinking of aquaponics here, where you're growing fish and leafy greens in the same ecosystem without any additives or chemicals or anything. Right. And you know the, the plants absorb the waste from the fish and that becomes the nutrients and then return the clean water to the fish and cycles back and forth, saves 90% compared to traditional agriculture. Not to mention it, rainwater, catch, rainwater catchers, which again- you Right, building the, the infrastructure for that. Yeah. And also because most developing countries are stuck in this trap of paying the debt back in dollars and euros, you end up, when you're thinking of your agricultural strategy as a, as a developing country that suffers from droughts, you say, well, I need to generate a lot of dollars to pay the debt. So what is the thing that I can produce here that will be exportable to Europe or to other countries so I can earn dollars to pay my debt? You say, well, Europeans like a lot of strawberries. I can grow a lot of strawberries in here and, and, and have a huge export market, which is true. You know, uh, strawberries are in high demand in Europe, but guess what? Strawberries are massive consumers of water. So you end up shifting your most precious water resources, your most fertile land to producing strawberries for exports, and you can't feed corn or wheat or rice to your people, and you end up having to import them anyway. Uh, That's just inefficiency. When you talk about, when economists talk about efficiency, this is the most absurd type of inefficiency but of course they talk about efficiency and efficiency in terms of making money right. here we're talking about quality of life we're talking about livelihood we're talking about survival what is the most effective way of doing this is not growing strawberries in the middle of the desert <laughs> <laughs> because that's not the most efficient way of, of using your your resources um, so we can we can go on talking about developing countries but it relates to climate change because you know, climate refugees in developing countries in, in the Middle East and Africa are already there. Right. They're moving by the thousands, by the millions. They're just invisible because they have no voice. There's no reporting. And then you see a, a, a civil war conflict or terrorism or whatever, and that gets reported. But you don't get reporting on some of the root causes that are tied to climate change. And then we focus all of our attention to military budget to fight terrorism, to push the refugees back to where they belong, to build walls to keep them out of uh, this country, to you know, send troops to push them back to the, their, their native countries without linking all these pieces of the puzzle. So when I go back to your first question about the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, all of these questions and, and big global issues are multifaceted. There's so many interconnected pieces and you can't have just economists addressing these issues or just politicians in, D in DC addressing these issues. You need to have this 
um, sort of connect all the dots in an interdisciplinary, multifaceted ways, uh, so that we address all the root causes. We we don't we don't fight an issue without addressing its its root cause, uh, and it's and it's you know to be frank, this is not just a, a public policy failure. This is a failure of academia altogether because we decided to specialize in different departments and make sure that departments don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And then we, we try to fight the same problem. You have scientists in the other building fighting climate change and economists in this building and, and um, you know, environmental scientists in the other, and they don't talk to each other. They don't know each other's research. They don't know each other's methods and successes and failures. And then you, you try to throw this in a, at, at, the, at the UN or in a government you know, agency, and it's like different people speaking different languages. They care about the same issue, but they have no way of how to put these things together in a more effective way. And to me, the most important piece of the puzzle is the, the idea that most of these groups say, we can't afford it, where's the money to do this? And the economists, of course, contribute in the same way. They say, well, we have to tax somebody or borrow from somebody, otherwise we can't afford it. And this is where MMT comes in. It says all of these groups, the scientists and the environmentalists and, and the politicians, they all care about the same issue. We want to solve the same issue. But here is a piece of information that will liberate your thinking a little bit. And the piece of information that MMT brings here is that it's affordable. We have the resources. We have the way to finance it. So now give me your best shot as a scientist. What do you think we should do? Because most scientists and engineers, when they start their thinking process, say, well, how much money will this cost? And if th there's no way that the government will fund any of this, we're not even going to pursue this line of research because we don't think it's doable. And this is, this is how we slow down the progress and research and development and, and, and public policy because we, we start with the assumption that we can't afford it. And then we muddle through. Well, let me ask you this before we go. What then to the people watching this, what, what, how do people get involved or how do people um, participate in this who aren't economists or scientists or whatever? How do they get involved and, and try to move the needle on this? Well, for, for the average person who's not involved in, in politics, is not involved in, uh, in academia, uh, the best group that I can think of is Real Progressives, which is a, a grassroots organization. Um, you can find them on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, it's, it's sort of turning into a media company, a small media company, lots of interviews with MMT activists and MMT economists um, and, and legal scholars and, and others, environmentalists, and, and people running for office on a, with an MMT-informed public policy platform. Mm -hmm. You'll hear all those voices on, on real progressives. You'll get plugged into tons of resources. Uh, in terms of um, public policy think tanks, there's uh, the Global Institute, um, uh, check us out on, on social media, on our website. There's the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College. Also, lots of my colleagues there do fantastic work. And the, the truth is that we're, we're outnumbered. When, when you think of how many people have this understanding in, in academia, how much funding these you know, research institutes have versus you know, the Koch brother funded uh, institutes, um, in terms of media appearances, I mean, I, just listening to NPR, listening to anything, it's kind of um, disturbing the amount of insanity from well-meaning uh, people, you know, very smart people in, in government and, and involved in politics who say, you know, this deficit, this national debt, we're going broke, we need to rein in the deficit. And these are people who are attacking, for example, President Trump. You can attack him on a whole bunch of things. But to focus on the deficit and the national debt as the this is the thing that really upsets you about the Trump administration, um, and and then bringing up you know the the Clinton surpluses as you know look at Clinton and you know how he managed to give us the best economy with the surplus. Well, guess what? If the government federal government is running a surplus, it means that it's taking more money out of the rest of us, the economy, than what the government is putting in. It's starving the economy of resources for no good reason. Right, because the government doesn't need a surplus. It's, it's the deficits that matter that people should really focus on is a deficit in infrastructure, the deficit in education, the deficit that households have, a huge household debt. This ties back to your question earlier about what is the next financial crisis. It's the student loan debt. It's household debt that fueled the last crisis and will fuel the next crisis. These are the deficits that matter. It's the climate debt that 
That's the debt that we need to be concerned about, not, not the national debt, right? So if we, if we start shifting our thinking to the issues that really matter and have a very basic understanding of how these things, how public finance works, then we, we separate our obsession with, with the federal government debt and, and set it aside and focus on the debts and deficits that really matter. It's the inequality deficits, it's the climate debt. It's, these are the things that should be at the forefront of public policy with. And, and these are honestly issues that it's not really Democrats or Republicans that should be fighting each other over this. Once we clarify this lens, you'll find a lot of libertarians, a lot of you know, you know, Republicans who say, well, I care about clean water too, but I thought we couldn't afford it, right? It's, I, I thought that in order for those people in the Midwest to have clean water, the federal government is going to tax me into poverty to create resources for them. And MMT says, you don't have to tax anybody to fix the water pipes in Detroit. Right. The federal government can do it. We have the material resources, the physical resources, the know-how, the technology. We know how to put pipes into buildings, into you know, um, water infrastructure. What's stopping us from doing it? It's because we think it's too expensive. And as a result, we start coming up with all kinds of justifications and end up fueling all the hatred and racism and inequality that we have into the system. We say, well, that's a poor town. We're not going to prioritize it. We'll start with, with the other towns. And we're going to dedicate, you know, the clean water goes here, the dirty water goes there. Who cares at the end? I mean, this is, and for, for those of us who have the basic MMT understanding, you look at all of these problems that we have in this country and we say, this is unnecessary. This is completely unnecessary. Yeah. We know how to do it. We know how to fix it. We can put millions of people to, to work with decent wages and benefits to make better quality of life for everyone. Why are we not doing it? So. Well, uh, you know, uh, Professor, thank you so much for being on the show and, and sharing all this. It's eye-opening for me. And now you've given me as a, uh, you know, progressive indie media comedian uh, something more. <laughs> I was literally while you were talking thinking, I got to write a joke in my act that explains MMT and gets people to laugh and understanding it to, to address your point of there's not a lot of us and we need more than just economists in this building and scientists in that building. Exactly. To address exactly. It. So and this is this is really what what the real progressive uh, movement is about. I mean, we, uh, a good friend of mine who's a, a British comedian, I'll be happy to introduce you to, he's, he's MMT fluent 100%. He's actually one of the co-hosts of the MMT podcast, uh, Christian Rally. Uh, I, I talked to him about writing, you know, you know jokes into, into his um, uh, stand-up shows and everything. He says he's, the public is not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> is, well, he might be is, true on that regard. And this is true. And this is why, because this conventional way of thinking about the world is so dominant. It's not just in economics. It's everywhere. It's pervasive. And that's why we need to transform this, not just within economics departments and economic disciplines. And, and it has to be in, in theater and music and entertainment. It has to be part of popular culture. And that's why we need this coalition of people from all over with all walks of life to bring their own example, their own contribution. As, as long as you have the the clear view of what public finances are about, then you can insert that into your, your own writings, your own you know, comedy, your own, um, it, it becomes part of popular culture so that we're not constantly being fed this, this mythology about money and, and finance. Um, and, and we have a, a, a strong group of uh, uh, people in the humanities now who are building this, this tradition, uh, at least within the humanities and it's interfacing with popular culture with music and entertainment but again we're outnumbered by all the other stuff <laughs> so please do i'll be happy to um bounce some ideas with you cool man well thank you so much and everybody please go to the global institute for sustainable prosperity i'll put the link in the show notes below many of you are already aware of real progressives but if not check them out um, so, and of course, uh, if you're watching the show, great ways to support it is go to my Patreon page and also like and share these videos. Um, those are great ways to get this information out here and to address the things that uh, Dr. Kaboob was just saying. Or, uh, Professor, are you, do are you a doctor? Are you a PhD? Yes. Okay, good. I don't want to give you a title. <laughs> I don't want you to be like, no, not yet. Um, good. You're a doctor. Uh, so, 
All the things that he just said, one of the ways you viewers can help is to share this video, is to watch my other videos on MMT if you're unclear about it. Um, I did a video with Stephen Hale. I've done numerous with Jeff Epstein from uh, Citizens Media TV. Watch the Stephanie Kelton interview on the Jimmy Dore Show. That's very informative. And share those videos out on your social media platform so that we can start to, uh, as you were just saying, get this, M get MMT is like a, everyone's talking about it. Everyone's aware of it. It'll really help change the narrative from this, where are we going right. to pay for it? Um, thing that everyone keeps saying. So um, right. Right. thank you so much for your time and thank you to everybody out there for watching. Thank you.